We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating human slavery, human trafficking, child exploitation, and child sexual abuse material through disrupting networks and applying data, technology, and advanced analytics and intelligence. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our panel discussion this morning. Anti-Human Trafficking Retail Consortium, an MSB, Payment Processing and Retail Perspective. We are honored that you have joined us today, and we're excited to share insights and information during our discussion today. By way of formal introduction, my name is Mark Scarmazino, and it is my honor and privilege to moderate the session today. Let me begin by sharing a little about my background, and then I will introduce our panelists for this session. By day, I'm a senior account executive within the Banking and Financial Institutions Group at ACI Worldwide. ACI Worldwide is the leader in real-time payments and delivers mission-critical real-time payments software solutions that enable financial institutions and corporations, such as merchants and billers, to process and manage digital payments, power omni-commerce payments, and present and process bill payments, along with the related fraud risk and fraud risk management. I'm proud to state that ACI Worldwide will not tolerate modern slavery in any of our businesses and is committed to taking steps to end forced labor, whether in the form of human trafficking or otherwise. I'm also a very active volunteer participant in the critical mission and activities of ATI. I'm a member of the ATI Advisory Council, where I participate in the strategic discussions and direction and future planning for ATI. And I'm also the volunteer chairperson of the Anti-Human Trafficking Retail Consortium, or the ATRC. ATRC is the newest consortium under the ATII umbrella and was founded with a purpose to equip organizations to better identify risks related to human trafficking, child exploitation, and child sexual abuse material, or CSAM, within the retail industry, which includes a specific focus on the use of gift cards as a payment facilitator of human exploitation. As we get started with our discussion today, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. And I would like to begin first by thanking them for their time and efforts for this session. Very much appreciated, and thanks again. Let me begin with Jessica Smith. Jessica is a cybersecurity analyst currently working within the retail private sector. And prior to transitioning to the private sector, Jessica spent six years working within legal services via her home state's Department of Corrections. During her tenure with the Department of Corrections, she completed her bachelor's degree in psychology and criminal justice, as well as a master's of science in criminal justice. Jessica holds certifications in interviewing and interrogation from Century College, critical incident management from FEMA, as well as social media intelligence expert and cyber intelligence professional from McAfee Institute. In addition to her current role as an, an intelligence analyst, Jessica serves as the volunteer special investigations lead for the National Child Protection Task Force, managing cases with high levels of sensitivity, complexity, and longevity. Outside of her day job and volunteer work, Jessica is also in the process of building ClickSafe Intelligence, a nonprofit dedicated to educating and empowering parents and youth to engage safely with social media through intelligence-based dark web research into child predators and their grooming tactics. As if that wasn't enough, Jessica is also a member of the leadership team of the ATRC. And Jessica and I have worked closely uh, together with ATI leadership to kick off the ATRC recently. Thanks for being with us today, Jess. Thanks, Mark. Also on our panel today is Rich LaBelle, Rich is the Executive Director of the Transaction Record Analysis Center, or TRAC, an organization that manages a financial transaction database accessible to U.S. law enforcement only and which contains global money service business remittance data that is obtained through legal process. Additionally, TRAC provides training to law enforcement and the financial sector throughout the U.S. on detecting criminal activity found within the global remittance sector. Prior to joining TRAC, Rich enjoyed a 22-year law enforcement career in the state of Connecticut and with the Phoenix Police Department, including time working on multiple task forces, 
Rich's investigative experience primarily included investigating large-scale drug trafficking and money laundering organizations operating along the southwest border. Rich has presented at law enforcement and financial conferences, both nationally and internationally, on methods utilized by criminal organizations to move illicit funds through the financial system. Rich is a CAMS certified anti-money laundering specialist and earned a Bachelor of Science in Justice Studies from Arizona State University. Thanks for joining us today, Rich. Thank you. Next member of our panel is Sylvia Krupena. Sylvia is Red Compass Lab's financial crime expert with over 18 years international working experience in the financial sector. Sylvia has a proven track record in fields such as payments, open banking, financial crime, and regulations. Her extensive background across project, product, and change management, business and data analysis, as well as subject matter expertise across various knowledge domains, gives Sylvia great insight when assessing or implementing complex changes effectively. Over the past three years, Sylvia has developed the Red Flag Accelerator Topologies, the award-winning largest single source of human trafficking red flags for financial services globally. Thanks for joining us, Sylvia, and for sharing your expertise. Thank you for having me. There are several topics that we'd like to discuss today on the panel, so let's begin. With, for topic one, since the focus of our panel today is on the retail sector, let's begin our discussion with Rich. Rich, I think the audience would be very interested in track and the great things you do with data and working together with law enforcement. So to kick us off, please share some information about what exactly is TRAC and how it can be used in trafficking investigations. Right, so thanks again, Mark, for having me. Um, so you know, the, the, the short Reader's Digest version of what TRAC is, essentially we are a repository of global money service business uh, remittance data that we make available to law enforcement through the use of a web-based uh, system. So it's currently accessed by um, several hundred agencies around the United States, um, which you know, which makes up uh, about 10,000 individual law enforcement users around the U.S. have access to TRAC. Uh, and, and what we do is, as far as you know, how TRAC is used for uh, trafficking investigations. One of the the methodology that you know, or the the message that we try and push upon law enforcement is, you know, use use track data to to put together a financial investigation into trafficking cases, um, because we believe that you know there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, I think when you you know when you look at trafficking investigations, people don't care. You know, law enforcement doesn't care how we can put people in jail as long as we can do it. Put bad guys in jail. Um, and if you can accomplish that through the use of a financial investigation, as opposed to trying to get you know victims to cooperate and make them witnesses, which can oftentimes be difficult, let's go ahead and do it and look at things from the you know from the financial angle. Um, so that's really the main reason our message to you know to our users is use the track data to see how it might be involved in, in with the, you know and in, in being used in these trafficking investigations. That's great, Rich. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing that. So with respect to trafficking, does the data currently contained within TRAC reveal any trends that uh, you can share? Yeah, so what we do, um, you know, when we speak to law enforcement, we, you know, we say, particularly on the sex trafficking side of things, you know, the old the old paradigm with law enforcement during and sex trafficking cases is, you know, Undercover undercover officers answer online ads, and then they go meet somebody to strike up a deal, and they arrest somebody, and they cut them a citation, and they're and they're you know the, the girl is often sent on her way. But there's really not much work is done into the trafficker side of it to identify the traffickers. So what we do is we tell them look at our look at our data, um, and historically when we've done that, you know when you think about money service business data, which many of the big box retailers have MSBs located within those stores. Um, when you look at the, you know, the traditional brick and mortar um, MSB data, we would we would see a connection, you know, where oftentimes with, with trafficking investigations, particularly with females, they're sent to different cities around the world, you know, around the United States, um, and oftentimes money gets sent back and forth between them and their trafficker, who might be located in a, a different city at times. So we've looked at the, you know, the brick and mortar data that we have. Um, 
in our system. But I think we've actually, you know, we've probably seen a, a decline in the use of that data. Um, and I think any, you know, any investigator who's watching this knows over the past few years, there's been a huge spike in the use of mobile, the, you know, mobile money transmitters um, and the use of, you know, phones to to move money and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, place, use that money to place ads and, and carry out the business, um, which, you know, is, is good and bad. Um, but what we've also done in terms of, you know, our data set that we have is we, we, we have a pretty healthy data set of, of Bitcoin ATM data within our system. So, you know, once we started to see a slight decline in the use of the brick and mortar stores, we wanted to look at Bitcoin ATM data and see if it, there was anything there, um, you know, that, that told the story for us. And I don't want, I certainly don't want anyone to think that this is a broad brush condemnation of Bitcoin ATM companies, because there are some of them out there that do a really good job of keeping, trying to keep bad actors out, you know, but it's just like any other business. Some people are better, you know, than others than uh, keeping the criminals out. But what we did was we, you know, we tried to employ a certain methodology um, and we started off by um, using blockchain analytics tools that we have at, you know, at our disposal. Um, there are a handful of companies out there that um, have been around for a while and really do a good job of blockchain analytics, particularly Bitcoin for this, you know, for this particular case. Um, what we want to do is we utilize those tools and try to identify Bitcoin addresses that have been <laughs> attributed to known um, entities that are prolific in the trafficking world. And in, in this particular case, um, we looked at adultsearch.com and Rub Ratings, which are two websites that are that are known to be, you know, commonly used in the trafficking industry. Um, and through the anal blockchain analytics, we were able to identify approximately a quarter of a million Bitcoin addresses that have been known to be attributed to those two sites, whether they're their payment processors that are being utilized for them or, um, you know, exactly how they're being attributed to it and how they're being utilized. I I'm not sure. I believe it's probably payment processors, but we took all of those Bitcoin addresses from those sites. Um, and we ran them through our system, our track system, so I, to see if there's anybody that's walking up to Bitcoin ATMs around the U.S. and sending Bitcoin to those addresses. And we found several thousand transactions within our data set. Um, now, the good part about that, you know, when you walk up to a Bitcoin ATM, for those that aren't familiar, if you're going to purchase Bitcoin at an ATM, you're almost always going to have to also include a telephone number in addition to an ID or, you know, give some kind of PII. But... The telephone number is super valuable because it often you end up getting a um, multi-factor authentication text sent to your phone, which you need to enter into the machine to complete the transaction. Well, within tra within track, you know, we have millions of telephone numbers. Um, so when we you know when we looked at those several thousand transactions that we found through the um, ATMs, we then took out the telephone numbers from those transactions. And then we also utilize some other tools out there that uh, scrape websites um, that are known, the, the websites that are known to be prolific for, for trafficking, um, such as, you know, use Spotlight, Traffic Jammer, two of the more well-known ones. And we utilize those tools. And we know when people, our ads are placed on the internet, you know, where girls are oftentimes advertised, there's always going to be a telephone number because they need to be contacted, right? So you're gonna have telephone numbers, sometimes you'll have email addresses. And we want to see if we can place our Bitcoin ATM transactions, the telephone numbers that we have there, and see if there's any correlation to the ads that are being placed online. And what we found is there's about a 60% overlap with the transactions that we have in our data are also found being utilized to place ads online. So what's really cool about it is it allows investigators to now able, to, you know, you're now able to put PII, a name, a face, um, a telephone number, a location in which they're, you know, they're located at, you can place that oftentimes with the ads, you know, to the person that's being advertised online or the telephone number that's being utilized. Because what we've also found is a lot of the, the a lot of the overlap um, oftentimes is, is are, the, are males walking up to the machines and, and buying Bitcoin. So, you know, I personally believe it's probably pimps or traffickers out there that are that are buying you know, getting Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin, and then they're placing the ads for the girls that they have under their control. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a pretty, it's it's a it's a different way of approaching investigations. Um, but I, you know, we think it's it's super effective. Um, one of the thing, you know, one of the other things that we see oftentimes too is the people that are buying 
um, Bitcoin, and that's attributed to you know websites like Adult Search. The dollar amount is really consistent with that, which would be purchased to to go purchase an ad. So it's the average dollar transaction is about fifty five to sixty dollars when we see somebody you know sending money to Adult Search, whereas the average dollar transaction at a Bitcoin ATM within our system is about five hundred and ninety bucks is the average transaction except for once you send money to adult search or or rub ratings it's it's going to be in the 55 to 60 dollar range um but in terms of like how the retail industry is affected by that we also see a really big overlap with the people that are buying <clears throat> uh, purchasing bitcoin uh, attributed to those sites are also frequenting carding sites where they're probably buying stolen credit card numbers which as we all know you know in the those in the retail industry know how that works, right? They buy the stolen credit card numbers, they get encoded on a credit card, they come into your store, you know, they, they buy whatever they're gonna buy, and then there's chargebacks, you know, three weeks later or whatever it is, because you find out that the it's you know the goods or the credit card numbers that were utilized were stolen. Um, so there's definitively a you know a, a big overlap in it. Um, I think here in the US, when we I looked at the top 10 cities in which we're seeing some overlap with um, the ads being placed online for the trafficking sites and, and the crypto purchases. Um, no surprise, Miami, Dallas, LA, Houston are the are the top ones. I think Miami was really um, super prolific. Like the numbers for Miami were, were off the charts, mm -hmm. uh, which really shouldn't come as much of a surprise. So, um, you know, that's that's what we that's what we are. That's what we do. We you know, we just we try and offer tools that make tools available to, to law enforcement to, to investigate and approach the, the problem from a different angle. Well, that, that's great, Rich. Really appreciate you sharing the thoughts and, and some of the insights into, you know, not only what you, you know, what's done, you know, with track and kind of the, you know, some of the interesting information that comes from that. Thanks for uh, for sharing that. Um, before we jump to topic two, um, Sylvia or just uh, anything based on what Rich said here that you'd like to add or any thoughts that may have struck you while uh, you know, Rich was speaking or should we uh, you know, go right ahead and, and, and move on to our next topic? Uh, Rich, I think um, your, your insights into how Bitcoin is being used is going to be incredibly useful uh, as cryptocurrency in general uh, makes its way further and further into the private sector um, and into retail more specifically. I know some companies are just barely starting to adopt accepting it. Uh, we're going to see that overlap and that need for information to help bolster not only theft and fraud cases, but any sort of other case with a financial nexus. We all here know that um, exploitation and human trafficking are financially motivated crimes. So uh, I love that that track is doing this work. And I think that uh, your insight into the cryptocurrency world and how it is um, overlapping into the retail sector is only going to become more important as we move forward. Uh, great, great, great thoughts there. Uh, just thanks for sharing. Sylvia, anything or should we uh, just segue right into uh, our next topic? We can segue further. Excellent. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, no, great, uh, great info there, Rich. Thanks. So, so be with kind of with that said, let's you know maybe turn to you now for uh, you know for some thoughts on Red Compass Labs and the very uh, you know notable and interesting things you're doing in this uh, space as well. I, I think the audience would be uh, very interested in the area of financial crime on a global basis as it relates to human trafficking and the red flags and topologies uh, you know related to CSAM. So what are you seeing in the areas of human trafficking crimes and finance globally? And what are some of the challenges in tackling uh, you know, these offenses from a, uh, a financial crimes perspective? Thank you, Mark. And thanks again for this opportunity uh, to be with you here today. A uh, little bit at first, maybe about the company, what we do. So we are financial services uh, consulting firm, but now these days also technology firm. So we've been around about 20 years. And we are offering services globally, and mainly our domain has been payments. And there was one day about four or five years ago when we realized that where the payments are, there are not only good things happening, but they are also bad side of the payments, where the payments are used to buy and sell people, to abuse children. And we thought if we are in this business, that there's definitely we can do something about that. 
Uh, and um, so those uh, five years ago, we started to bring and increase our expertise in this field and uh, going next to the next topic in terms of global landscape and, and global footprint of these crimes. Um, as we know now, it's um, one of the largest financial crimes. Human trafficking is the second largest crime after drug trafficking, and that's globally, and it makes billions and billions every year. And as Jess just said, it's financially motivated. So abusing, selling, buying people, that is for profit. And so everybody needs to come together to, to stop that, starting from financial sector. But we cannot do that just from financial sector perspective. So everybody in society, uh, including law enforcement, government, everybody, even consumers can do something about that. Um, and over the past few years, we have seen quite dramatic changes in the world. Uh, one is happening as we speak, which is the uh, Ukraine crisis and military conflict there. And uh, just watching that and seeing people displaced and creating new vulnerabilities, uh, that is opening doors again for human traffickers to take uh, advantage on the people who have been forced to leave their homes. That is one of the key things. And, and these crises always bring the best in people and also the worst in people. Mm -hmm. So they're always helping, coming together, let's rescue, let's help. And also the other part of humanity who will go and abuse and take advantage. So that's the most recent. And the uh, previous one, which we're still coming out of, is COVID, of course. And COVID is um, having a major impact across the globe, of course, as we all know. That's no news for anyone. And what is probably less known or less spoken about is impact on children. So since COVID started, the CSAM and child sexual exploitation online has skyrocketed. Uh, that's due to different factors, and one of them being that children have been at home, there is more technology available, and also technology advances are providing for criminals and traffickers much better ways how to hide, including we just spoke about cryptocurrencies, and if there's any anonymity anywhere available online, then definitely the criminals will be the ones who will take advantage of that because uh, there are different means and different technology is just technology. You can the same like payments that you can use it for good and for bad. So so looking at the typologies and what we're seeing being reported across the globe, we can see also the bad side of that. And uh, to mention some key factors, probably and key elements of that is, of course, the first big uh, I would say not scandal, but case probably, but that could be scandal as well, was Westpac fine, which was Australia, which was billions of uh, almost a billion of dollars. And they, that it all kicked it off. And, and then COVID started and we can see that across the globe more and more reports coming in. And why I'm mentioning that in, in such a detail, uh, that because probably this audience is much closer to the issue and much more invested and have more tools. And in terms of that, if, if we have labor and tra uh, sex trafficking, which is probably more mature crime types and more mature uh, predicted crimes and, and uh, modus operandi is, is much better understood, then this is something that definitely is really, really international, where much more people need to come together to try to solve that, starting from internet service providers to crypto providers to traditional financial institutions and also private sector as, as we do. Excellent, excellent, very interesting. Uh, Sylvia, could you share some maybe additional insight into maybe part of the solution or the solutions that you see and maybe the significance of, you know, having and sharing up to date red flags and topologies as well as intelligence with context, you know, to, to help cross sector, you know, partners maybe recognize and report on these crimes and, and what has been done so far? Yes, it is. Um, as human trafficking and child sexual exploitation are increasingly global. It's, there is, it's borderless. It's uh, our criminals find more and more ways, quite creative ways, how to exploit the situation. So mm -hmm. the solution also should be same creative, same inventive and same global. So what we are doing in, in our institution where we think we could help to close some gaps Every event we go, or there's some conference, or there is some, some gathering in industry, or we speak individually with banks, for example, or other large organizations, what they normally ask is, 
where can I find flags? Like, but the flags, like if when you have financial uh, regulators, like for example, FinCEN, they issue very good guidance, very good long list of bullet points, which kind of activities you need to look out for. But for banks, that means gathering all the information, then translating this whole information into the language they understand. So how their systems are written, what data are located where, what data points they need, what, how can they possibly imp can implement that? What does that mean in terms of their rules and how does that fit together with the ML systems and vendors. So this is the work where we're coming in and really helping to, to, to close this gap. So instead of thousands and thousands of banks and analysts would go and do this work for themselves. So we provide for all banks absolutely for free as giving back, as, as closing that gap of bad payments, these typologies that are up to date and, and each bank can use. And that is not only banks, because there are all aspects of that. There's also retail side where we can see where all the money movements, how people do pay for their everyday expenses and each crime type, each uh, type of exploitation or trafficking involves different kind of behaviors. And what we have, uh, the methodology we have implemented is persona based and data driven and persona based that we are gathering all those flags that are published across the world and we are packaging them in scenarios that follow that criminal, that actor, or, or also a victim. Depends on which persona we, we are gathering together in that story. So that also helps with more focused investigation. And also, you, you don't have to run 2,000 red flags just alone, but you run them in a focused uh, area. Like if you are looking for the facilitator who is uh, abusing children and putting out CSA material, so they do behave in certain way, they buy certain things, they spend money on internet in a specific way. And so that's all gathered together and for bank and also other investigators gives better picture what is exactly that what they are seeing. And that applies also across different other crime types. And in terms of solution, like I mentioned also when answering the previous question, I think really everybody needs to come together and find the best way how to cooperate and collaborate globally. There are some really fantastic initiatives as we are here today, uh, ATAI, ATRC, then we work together with the Traffic Analysis Hub and a bunch of uh, NGOs which are doing absolutely fantastic work on the ground. And at the Noble that we are involved as well in some projects with them, which they are doing fantastic work. So they are incredible initiatives across the globe, but we need to take a step further how, how we can increase the reach and how we become more global and share the information, not necessarily private protected information, but at least typology, at least we have seen these things happening and these behaviors happening. So everybody can share that and know that. And I think that would be very powerful are uh, helping uh, to, to protect the vulnerable and also to to catch the bad guys. Yeah, that's outstanding, Sylvia. And thanks for sharing that information, and particularly the you know the concept of collaboration and the need for that, right? But in addition, the the context around scenarios and how they're applicable to specific uh, you know investigations and different types of cases. Very very important uh, information that you share there, Sylvia. Thanks uh, thanks for doing that. Um, Rich uh, or Jessica, any um, any thoughts to to share um, from some of the information that uh, Sylvia was speaking about, or should we move on to uh, to our next point? You know, I'll just say really quick, Mark, uh, to Sylvia's point, and she's you know she's right. Technology can be used by both good and bad, um, and and you know the money aspect of it, like I touched on earlier, is no is no different. Um, you know, because of the ease in which money is moved around the world right now. Uh, particularly on the crypto side, it's one of the big challenges facing crypto now. How do we regulate it around the world? Because you can you can send money from here. I can send money from here in Arizona to somebody you know on the other side of the world in a matter of minutes. Um, it's great. The, the the benefits of it are great from a financial inclusion standpoint, and that it allows for the unbanked population around the world to to get money much easier than they've ever been in the past. 
the flip side of that, you know, from the negative standpoint is it also allows, allows criminal organizations to operate across multiple jurisdictions at one time, which makes it extremely difficult from a law enforcement perspective. So it is, you know, we talk about collaboration, um, international collaboration. It's, it's more important now than it's as important now as it's ever been, um, you know, from a, particularly from a policy you know, standpoint. And, and how do we all get on the same page so that we're not fighting each other and, and you know, really fighting it, having a, a unified front as opposed to battling one another? That's uh, a great, uh, great point to add, uh, Rich, and thanks for uh, for doing that. Um, Jessica, anything to add on on that point um, or, you know, to what uh, you know, Sylvia and, and Rich were saying, or should we move on to, um, you know, to the next topic? Uh, I'll just add super fast. I think uh, the within the private sector, uh, trafficking and exploitation typologies are not something that we really talk about. Oftentimes we don't think that they are applicable to our business. Uh, and the more that we start exposing ourselves to that and educating our, our staff and, and the private entities in general on what these things are, uh, the more likely we are to actually find them within our business and be able to call them out and uh, bring those to, to the attention of law enforcement. So uh, I think that like Sylvia and Rich said, like the good and the bad exists everywhere. And until we know what bad to look for, we're, we're bound to miss things, unfortunately. No, and that's such an important point, um, Jess. And, and maybe even just to sort of go off script for a quick second, in many ways, that's what the, uh, the intent and the goal of ATRC is, right? Within the retail uh, you know, sector to help, you know, with that specific challenge with that education with that ability to know kind of what to uh you know to look for and how to identify and how to educate you know whether it's you know frontline personnel folks who are interacting with uh you know the you know the, the general public and, and and the retail uh you know folks in general so very important um and so maybe with um you know with that being said let, let's turn our attention to you know some of the you know the inf you know the information that you're going to share with us from uh you know maybe the retail perspective along with some of the you know the great work that's being done by NCPTF uh, so I, I guess I have a multi-part question for you given the important work you're doing with NCPTF and even uh you know ATRC so would you maybe begin by sharing a little information about the work done by NCPTF and then the collaboration with law enforcement and the uh the private sector please and if you can, you know, sprinkle in some information about maybe that intersection, you know, with retail, uh, maybe the social media phenomenon, maybe financial services uh, as well. You know, for example, what a company in the retail sector does or can do to get involved in a case of human trafficking uh, or exploitation, please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'll start with um, NCPTF and the collaboration with law enforcement, and then I'll work our way to the, the retail sector engagement. So NCPTF, for those of you who don't know, the National Child Protection Task Force is a nonprofit. We work cases primarily focused on child exploitation, uh, everything from missing children, online predation, geolocation of child sexual abuse material. All of the cases that we work are done so in partnership with law enforcement. We do not initiate cases on our own. We're not a vigilante organization. Uh, another big arm of the organization is we offer training to both the public sector and the private sector. Our focus is on training law enforcement, but as more and more private sector organizations want to get more involved and develop programs to identify abuse and exploitation, uh, we will train those organizations as well. So it's going to be everything from uh, digital investigative tactics, social media and open source intelligence tactics, cell phone, uh, computer forensics, legal process, Cryptocurrency, we have uh, individuals who are well versed in all of those different areas and then a multitude of others as well. As far as NCPTF's collaboration and overlap within the retail sector and the private sector uh, in general, in addition to the training that I mentioned, we also partner with private sector entities in a variety of other ways. Uh, first being that we have volunteers from a multitude of different private sector organizations, everything from retail to banking, transportation, technology. All of our volunteers from these arenas bring a different lens to our investigations and they help us find potential resources and connection points to leverage during uh, our investigations that traditionally might not have been thought about uh, either by ourselves, by other organizations involved in that case, or by law enforcement. 
NCPTF also acts as a kind of centralized hub for collaboration between the public sector and the private sector for these entities to come together on kind of neutral ground. So for example, if you're an analyst or investigator within the private sector, something shows up in one of your financial investigations that's completely outside of your purview, but you recognize is a problem that needs to be addressed, NCPTF can help you find the right person or law enforcement jurisdiction to notify uh, in the event that you don't have an established trusted point of contact or you just aren't necessarily comfortable going through the traditional law enforcement emergency line mm. or filing a general report. As far as what the private sector can do to get involved, there is a multitude of different ways. And when I say involved, I mean, you can collaborate with NCPTF, um, you know, getting more involved in the, the anti-exploitation and anti-trafficking space in general. So first being establish a connection with your local law enforcement agency beyond your typical pipeline of engagement. So say you are a convenience retailer, having your store employees talk with their local departments about other types of crimes outside of just traditional theft, fraud, and safety and security issues to understand what is going on that could bleed into your particular store locations in a, in a specific area, what staff can watch for, and then what else they can do, you know, who do they tell? What do they, what do they do if they see something concerning? Go above and beyond outside of your typical lens uh, as a private sector entity who is traditionally just focused on financial crime. Mm. This, this also extends beyond local law enforcement as well, frankly. Um, yes, the connectivity to your local jurisdictions are gonna be very, very important. And it's a, it's a starting point that you, you, know, you often, you have to nurture and take care of ensuring that you have POCs at the state and the federal levels as well to do everything from, you know, just, hey, I have something really weird going on. Can you give me a gut check? All the way up to working, you know, a multi-jurisdiction case where you have millions in fraud losses, having those experts at that, that state and the federal level to rely on um, in order to successfully work, work a case and help victims is going to be crucial for uh, the, the private sector as well. Uh, another option is educating your law enforcement on what you what they can come to you for. Uh, many private sector organizations have formal law enforcement request programs, but often there is this issue of they don't know what they don't know. So if they don't know what they can co what you as a private organization, what you collect, what you analyze, um, how they can partner with you, who do they even reach out to? they're not going to be able to do it. So by helping those LA partners uh, better understand how they can get in touch with you and what they can request of you, increases the likelihood that they're going to come to you for support. Another thing is, um, which Sylvia talked about at, at great length, is education of your data export um, experts on exploitation, red flags, and indicators. So this is everything from your multi-market investigators to your fraud analysts, Anyone that does any sort of intelligence collection that is internal data focused to your organization, um, specific to criminal activity, arming these teams with what to look for is going to help them more easily spot potential activity that goes above and beyond, again, that traditional fraud lens. And lastly, um, and I know this is gonna make a lot of people scared uh, and maybe uncomfortable, but developing investigative and analytical programs that are focused outside of uh, those traditional financial crime areas. Yeah. So uh, historically, this is not something that the private sector really has, you know, it's, it's not our business. We are not human trafficking investigators. We're not ex exploitation experts. It's, it's hard to cross over into this world when it doesn't directly connect to your business. But as time goes on, um, more and more shifting into the digital space. We have cryptocurrency, we have online ordering where money laundering can take place. There's more and more opportunities for this to creep into our business area um, and have a direct impact. So uh, there are benefits to a private entity going above and beyond just the fact that this is a good thing to do and a good thing to think about. Uh, like we talked about, the majority of these efforts are still going to involve financial data as a means of identification, which means there's a very good chance that you're going to inadvertently identify suspicious activity that is still in line with your traditional focus areas. You're going to have new data pipelines. You're going to have innovative ways to examine and analyze data. 
And by attacking a problem that you've never dealt with before, having to think innovatively and, and creatively about how to figure out how to identify and dig into those issues, you're going to open up a new world of technological and analytical capabilities that um, you otherwise likely wouldn't have known existed. Great. And lastly, I'm sorry. sorry. No, I was just going to try and uh, you know, just make sure we covered the, the point. Oh, about, yeah, you know, absolutely. Go for it. Yeah, no, so because I just keep an eye on, on the clock as well, just because there's so much information we're trying to you know, squeeze into uh, you know, the 40 minute window or so that we have. But one yeah. of the important things that I think uh, the audience would enjoy hearing about would be, I think it's something like 99% of all of the investigations that are done by NCPTF are digital, right? Yeah. So maybe uh, share, could you share a little bit about how examining a case within NCPTF, uh, every piece of investigation in, you know, of info is investigated and that maybe intersection with law enforcement for subpoenas or something like that. Could we touch on that for a moment? Yeah, absolutely. So similar to what I kind of mentioned previously regarding how NCPTF works with the private sector, um, often law enforcement doesn't know how they can lean on private sector entities, retailers, for example, during investigations for help. Um, and the reality is private sector entities collect so much information and you just don't know what could be helpful in a case. So even if there isn't a financial component, as a private sector entity, making yourself available to your law enforcement partners, letting them know what those digital capabilities are, what the digital information you collect on your customers, your online activity, um, financial transactions. You never know what is going to be the thing that breaks the case. So just a quick example, um, during, you know, say an, a law enforcement case connection to a private entity, there's a connection that shows up such as like a banking deposit slip or a store receipt. Uh, one thing that NCPTF would do or one thing that law enforcement should do is like always get in touch with whomever is on that receipt. Uh, you don't know if it's going to have connectivity to it, but it very well might. Uh, NCPTF, we pay attention to all of that stuff. So if we see a store receipt, we see a, a brand logo, we see a bag from a shopping center, we are always going to take that next step to make the connectivity to the private sector. Um, even though we're just investigating digitally on social media, making that connection is going to open up a wealth of data and evidence that perhaps law enforcement wouldn't necessarily have gotten their hands on. Great, great point, Jess. Thanks for uh, for sharing that insight into NCPTF and all the, the great things that are uh, being done there. Um, I know we're getting tight on time, but Rich, Sylvia, I want to give you a chance to uh, you know comment or offer any thoughts related to that before we uh, you know we close our uh, our session. Anything to add, uh, Rich or Sylvia? So just one quick point probably what um, really kind of resonated with me is uh, being creative and finding ways how to how to do it better or how to do it differently that we are observing absolutely as well because we know out of all the crimes and from asset recovering it's just less less than one percent recovered in terms of all financial crimes so it that it just does not work what we're doing mo mostly today so create being creative finding the ways doing the differently absolutely seconding that every word great point so you rich anything to share i guess you get the last word as we get to uh take us home today. <laughs> yeah no, uh, to jess's point you know i think there's a if you peel back more layers of the onion you're, you're going to see the private sector is going to have some there, there's going to be a touch point somewhere along the line um i think it's important that we leverage as much of the data there's so much data out there now leverage it in a responsible way um, you know, and I think that's the key, do it responsibly. And there's legal processes in place that, that it can happen, you know, that can be accomplished. But um, not only is it important from a brand protection standpoint, you know, from your organization, but it's also, you know, it's just, I think it's just a socially responsible thing to do. I mean, I think we all have an obligation, you know, to do it. So um, that, you know, that would just be my really quick thought. I know we're short on time, but that, that's what I would have to say about that. No, and I appreciate that thought because that is, uh, and 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 thanks for, uh, for that both Sylvia and, uh, as well, Rich, uh, your point so important about you know getting involved, and you know we all do it from you know both uh, you know we're in the business of uh, you know of helping, but also from uh, you know volunteering time and effort and, and things like that. So very much uh, you know important uh, you know from the dedication of time as well as the uh, creativity needed to change the way in which we're uh, you know we've been looking at things and. Uh, you know, very much appreciate the, the time and information shared here today. So that concludes our panel discussion um, today on Anti-Human Trafficking Retail Consortium, or ATRC, uh, and MSB 
payment processing and retail perspective. Again, I'd like to thank our panelists for the time sharing for their time sharing their expertise on the these important topics. I'd also like to thank all of you for attending this session and for your interest in getting involved and participating in the fight against human trafficking and everything that we've been uh, you know, discussing here today. As you're all aware, the ATII is dedicated to combating global human trafficking by promoting corporate social responsibility through increasing awareness, facilitating intelligence integration, technology advancement, and encouraging strategic data collaboration. If you're interested in learning more about what you can do to participate in ATII or the ATRC, please do not hesitate to contact me at any time um, for matters of uh, ATII or ATRC. I can be reached at mark.scarmazino at aciworldwide.com and I'll give you my direct phone number. It's uh, in the US plus one, 917-691-7060. Um, folks, if you'd like to share your contact information with the group, you could do so now and then uh, it will wrap up for the day with our thanks and uh, appreciation for sharing the information today. So please, uh, Jess, maybe you wanna go first if you wanna share your info. Sure, mine is pretty easy. It is simply jessica at ncptf.org. Perfect, thanks. Maybe Sylvia, maybe next. Yeah, my email will be my name and surname. That's Sylvia, S-I-L-V-I-J-A dot Krupina, K-R-U-P-E-N-A at redcompass.com. Thank Great, you. Thanks. And Rich, uh, you as well, sir. Yeah, so it's rich dot labelle, and that's L-E-B as in boy, E-L at S-W-B-T-R-A-C dot com. And like Mark, my, my phone number, US plus one, 602-625-1679. And we'll be more than happy to help anybody out with any questions, if you have any. Appreciate that very much. And if anyone is interested, and uh, I think you know, my info might be on the ATI uh, you know, website under you know, or, or not, but I can certainly help get you in touch with uh, Jess Sylvia or Rich if you reach out to me uh, or anyone directly. Just want to say thank you to everyone again for uh, your time uh, and joining us today, as well as uh, hoping that you enjoy the rest of the, the conference, that enjoyed what you've seen uh, prior to today and everything, uh, and hopefully that you'll see going forward. We appreciate your time and thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Okay, goodbye thank all. You.